specifically with occupational epidemiology and cardiovascular disease. At the beginning of the decade, Mark Cullen published a commentary highlighting that heart disease has been really understudied in occupational studies. And this is despite the fact that we know a lot of work-related risk factors for cardiovascular disease. We know about the Whitehall studies with high demand and low control jobs. Uh, heat is a, a big problem for people who have underlying cardiovascular disease. People who work the night shift have elevated cardiovascular disease. And of course, the PM exposures are pretty extraordinary in a lot of these jobs. Um, and in the last decade, people have stepped up to the challenge. There's been a lot of analyses from existing cohorts. Often these were cohorts that were originally designed to study respiratory diseases or cancer. Um, and people have reanalyzed them for heart disease outcomes. And there's also been a few uh, small studies that have, with a few, a few numbers of workers that have studied um, short-term outcomes. And the hallmark of epidemiology, occupational epidemiology, really are these giant studies with tens of thousands of workers followed for mortality. And I'm going to focus mostly on those. But I will talk a little bit about some of these smaller studies because they are interesting. The second reason it's been a good decade for occupational epidemiology has been the advancements in statistical methods. And this has been specifically with regard to the healthy worker survivor effect, which I will also talk about a lot. <laughs> um, and it's been a major focus of my work at Berkeley and of, of Ellen Eisen's work. Um, uh, so occupational epidemiology adds a lot to the world of epidemiology. In the first place, there's, we've heard about this a lot already today, but there's a really big exposure range. And the average exposures that these workers have are one or two orders of magnitude higher than the ambient exposures. Um, we can really study long-term exposure to particulate matter, especially in these big studies. We can characterize a worker's exposure for their 40 years of work in a factory. We can really add up a lot of years of exposure, and that's usually more than we can do in the environmental arena. Um, and we have a well-defined population from an epidemiologic standpoint. That's a pretty satisfactory thing to have. And with these really big studies, there's usually no individual level recruitment. Um, so you don't have those sorts of biases, and we can usually rely on administrative records so you don't have recall bias and other problems that you can get in, in other areas of epidemiology. <coughs> um, so I'm going to go over first some of the occupational exposures and cohorts, and then I'll get into the healthy worker survivor effect, and then into some applied um, examples for how we handle the healthy worker survivor effect. So I've heard a lot about uh, ambient air pollution. But of course, there are workers who are exposed to traffic occupationally. Um, and I'm going to start off with a small study, an example of a small study. There's nine highway patrol officers. There have been a lot of papers written on these nine officers. Um, and they, have they were extensively studied. They were extensively studied. They were. But that's, that's kind of the other side of what you normally see in occupational epidemiology. They had in-vehicle exposures over several shifts for these officers. Um, they had cardiac and blood markers on these officers, and they're able to look at these short-term changes between their cardiovascular and blood outcomes and their exposures that they had in that shift. And they found in this, one of the papers was this particular paper where they saw that their inflammatory and coagulation markers were associated with the speed change pollutants. So when the officer slowed down or sped up suddenly, a specific pollution profile, and they were able to really highlight that. So that's an example. Onto a more typical epidemiology, uh, occupational epidemiology example are the truckers. So this is over 50,000 US truckers. This is Eric Arshik's study. 15 years of follow-up, they had long haul drivers, um, delivery drivers within towns. They had non-drivers, people who worked in the terminals. Um, and and this, paper, this cohort was originally put together to study diesel exhaust and lung cancer. And recently, uh, a group of people have reported that there are associations between duration of work as a driver, both as a long haul driver and as um, all kinds of drivers, <laughs> and heart disease mortality. And this got stronger after adjustment for the healthy worker survivor effect, which will be a theme. Another group of workers that I think aren't normally um, associated with diesel exhaust or traffic related exposure are miners. So this is a cohort called the Diesel Exhaust and Miners Study. This is the DEM study. This was jointly put together by NCI and NIOSH to study um, lung cancer as an outcome. Um, there's over 12,000 workers at eight non-metal mining facilities. These are facilities that were chosen because they were low in lung carcinogens. Um, a lot of follow-up. And I just wanted to point out here, although the point's been made a lot today, that the 
mean PM exposure underground in these mines is really high. So this is two milligrams per meter cubed. And the, the level that you're not supposed to surpass more than three days in the US is 0 0.035 milligrams. So these are really high exposures. Um, and we undertook a project to reanalyze this cohort for heart disease mortality. And we have two papers in progress right now in our group. Um, and again, it looks like diesel exhaust and PM increase the risk of heart disease mortality, especially after the adjustment for the healthy worker survivor effect. So that was traffic. We also have workers who are exposed to combustion products. And these are different um, jobs and different sources, but these, what these exposures all have in common is that they are from combustion. So I'll start off with the firefighters. And the firefighters are, um, usually it's pretty small studies done in the firefighters. So really interesting work is happening in firefighters right now trying to characterize what their exposures are. And they're gnarly and they're varied. Um, and that's where a lot of the really interesting work is happening right now with firefighters. But there's also some really small studies where they are looking at um, the, their exposure to these acute outcomes. Oh, the other thing I want to say about firefighters is that they are at really high risk for heart disease, especially fatal heart attacks, especially mm -hmm. while on the job. Um, and a lot of this has been associated or, or been attributed to uh, heat and the adrenaline rushes and um, dehydration. Uh, and, and then usually on the side, they're like, oh, and all that PM. But the PM has not really been studied that much, and, and you know, it's part of the, sort of the mix when it comes to firefighters. Uh, so here's an example of a study at 10 participants. There's a human controlled exposure study. They um, exposed them to wood smoke, which is one thing that firefighters this is, are exposed to. And this was supposed to mimic wildland firefighting, so maybe there would be more wood smoke there, um, while they were on a treadmill. So they're doing a little bit of exercise, as you would if you were a firefighter. And they had um, biomarkers, and um, they found increased uh, inflammation and oxidative stress markers after an hour of wood smoke exposure um, on these participants. Not all of these small firefighter studies have actually shown that. Um, some of them have been uh, negative for cardiovascular outcomes, which leads you to believe that maybe there's a lot of other stuff going on with firefighters, too, as there are. So this is the Boilermakers. This is also a fairly small study. This is David Christiani's study of 70 Boilermakers who are welders. Um, and they have incredible exposures. This is personal, real-time exposure monitoring on these welders. Um, and then they have a lot of biomarkers, but in this particular paper, they study the outcome of these ambulatory heart monitors. So they're monitoring their exposure and monitoring their heart function um, over a, a few different panels. And this study found increased odds of experiencing um, irregular heartbeats per unit of PM exposure. And then on to the big occupational epi studies. This is one that Kathy Hammond talked about um, earlier today when she had that Pope curve with the air pollution on one end and the smoking on the other end. You've seen a few times, and she filled in the occupational workers. The smelters were the ones that were closer and overlapping with smoking. That was where their PM exposure went. So this is um, over 5,000 <coughs> aluminum smelting workers. This is Mark Cullen's. Um, cohort. And this one was actually put together, unlike the other ones, this one has, actually was put together to study heart disease um, recently, in the last decade. And uh, Kathy went over a lot of the work that went into the gem to figure out what their PM 2.5 exposure was. They relied on years of data that had been collected and stored by the company, and then job exposure matrix. Gem is a job exposure matrix. So you're able to figure out, um, the records will tell you what job a worker held going back in time. And then uh, someone like Kathy can say, OK, for this job, had this exposure. And you can match what the average exposure was to the job, to everyone's job going back in time. It's a job exposure in the um, <coughs> This study, instead of relying on mortality outcomes, actually has information on health insurance claims. So we can see what people went to the doctor for, what they went to the hospital for, um, and, and find out incident disease instead of just mortality. Um, and disease, it's all actively employed person time. So these are people who are uh, exposed and going to the doctor at the same time. Uh, so we're able to get more short-term effects. Um, and we have found increased risk of incident IHD um, in the smelter workers, specifically after adjusting for the healthy worker survivor effect. 
The next category of exposure that's been studied uh, in workers in relation to IHD or cardiovascular disease is exposure to metalworking fluids. So these are fluids that are used in metal machining, um, and they are sprayed on drill bits, on saw blades, on grinding operations, and they're used to cool and lubricate the metal machining process. Um, and there's no combustion here, but the metal, the fluids can aerosolize and become uh, respirable and inhale. So there are two cohorts where, where um, metalworking fluids have been studied in relation to heart disease. One is the United Auto Workers General Motors cohort, and this is Ellen Eisen's um, cohort of 40,000 auto workers followed for 50 years for mortality. And there was, again, this, a job exposure matrix um, for respirable PM from three types of metalworking fluids, or oil-based metalworking fluids and water-based metalworking fluids, which sounds like two, but really it adds up to three. Um, and we've done a lot of work in the last decade uh, in this cohort, uh, really trying to figure out what's going on um, with IHD and also stroke and MI and broader categories of cardiovascular disease. Um, and a lot of the work developing the methods for how to adjust for the healthy worker survivor effect have happened using this cohort. Um, and it's not low, I think I'm going to get into this a little bit later on, but it's not really low hanging fruit. You know, the, these old occupational studies, as occupational studies have been going on for a long time, used to publish these lists of SMRs, these standardized mortality ratios. So what did these workers die from in relation to the general population? And sometimes you would see spikes for a rare disease, like a cancer or something. But the general, the, and overall, these workers um, seem like they die less from all cause and less from heart disease. And if you just do a naive look to see whether these chemicals or this, this PM is causing heart disease, it looks like it's not. So unpacking that has been a, a, was, uh, something we spent a lot of time with, especially in the General Motors cohort. Um, the aluminum fabricators cohort goes along with the smelter cohort. And usually I present them together and then separate them. But because we're going by source of particulate, I am separating them first here. So this is 8,000 aluminum fabricators. Um, same thing with job exposure matrix that Kathy talked about. We have health insurance claims on them. But here, in the fabricators, we were actually able to show in a regular Cox model, we were able to show that recent <coughs> exposure, exposure in the same year, was associated with incident IHD diagnosis. Um, without doing anything particularly fancy. But in order to figure out long-term exposure, we then had to start correcting for the healthy worker survivor effect. The last category of um, exposure I want to talk about are crustal sources of exposure. So this is coal and silica, which of course have been studied extensively for respiratory um, outcomes. But they've also um, both been associated with heart disease. So there's a MSHA, the Mining Safety and Health Administration, and NIOSH, um, has a national study of coal workers' pneumoconiosis put together to study pneumoconiosis um, and 9,000 workers. And, and um, a MSHA researcher published a paper that there were also increased risk of IHD mortality, especially with two types of the coal rank, the coal that was mined in Appalachia. And silica is the last one, and this, is, this made it, um, there was no low-hanging fruit with silica and, and heart disease. Silica has been studied a lot. Um, in occupational settings, but all of the SMRs and all of these papers were all below one, meaning that all of these workers looked like they were they had a lot less heart disease than the general public. Um, and there are a couple exceptions to that. There's a giant cohort of silica-exposed Chinese workers where there was an elevated risk, and then there were some granite-exposed workers where there was an elevated risk. But overall, um, when you, if you look at a lot of these occupational Exposures, it doesn't look like there's an elevated risk of heart disease. So Sally Picciotto here in our department has a, a grant to reanalyze um, the 2,500 diatomaceous earth workers as Harvey Checkaway's silica cohort um, to see if she can use the healthy worker survivor effect techniques to find an effect. So these workers have really high exposures to particulate matter. Um, and they have lots of different sources. Um, and they have exposure to other risk factors for cardiovascular disease heat, hydration, lifestyle factors, especially in the drivers. These are fairly sedentary workers. There's a lot of concern about smoking and diet. Um, but the other thing about these workers is they're all really healthy. You have to be really strong to work in a lot of these jobs. They come in really strong. 
And there's a lot of fitness testing. So not only, so to become a firefighter, you have to take this incredible series of physical, tremendously incredible exams to become a firefighter. And that's sort of the extreme, but even in most of these factory jobs, you have to be fit to wear a respirator. And there, as you were saying with your mask, you barely pull the air through, and these respirators, you have to have a certain level of cardiovascular and, and respiratory health to wear a respirator, and you have to continue to pass these tests all the way through. So there's sort of a culling or a keeping of the healthy people. Um, and they are general, and they are healthier than the general population. So what ends up happening in these occupational cohorts is that the healthier workers stay at work longer and they accrue more exposure. And this is because the less healthy workers are the workers who are more susceptible to the particulate matters, take more time off, they transfer to jobs with less exposure, or they leave work entirely and probably go work somewhere else, but they leave that occupation entirely. So what ends up it looking like in these analyses is that more exposure is good for workers. More exposure protects workers against heart disease. Um, and this has been a concern for a long time in relation to cancers, but it seems to be particularly true in relation to heart disease. And this could be because um, on the way to heart disease, people can have other signs and symptoms that, that they can feel. You know, someone doesn't feel a whole lot before they get lung cancer, which is still sort of part of the problem with why lung cancer is caught so late. But with heart disease, you can have metabolic syndrome along the way. You can have uh, heartbeat issues along the way, and you can really feel these changes and maybe leave your job. Um, or reduce your time at your job because of it. So when we, uh, when we analyze any occupational cohort data, we basically want to know whether cumulative PM exposure causes heart disease. That's our main question. Um, and when you think about the healthy worker survivor effect, you have to start to unpack this. So cumulative exposure is um, made up of exposure at more than one time, right? You add it up to get cumulative exposure. And this is just two times to keep things fairly simple. And exposure at, at um, time one can affect someone's health status. And, 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 it, um, and they, in turn, can leave work or reduce their exposure at the next time period. And this health status also causes their, their outcome. And this is a directed acyclic graph. Um, and using the rules of directed acyclic graphs, we can see that health status becomes something that we might want to deal with in our analyses. It's a confounder. It predicts exposure and it predicts your outcome. And you want to control for confounders when you do an analysis. You put it in your model, it's stratified, you do all sorts of stuff. But it's also on the pathway. So prior exposure affects your status, which affects your outcome. Right? It's part of the way in which the prior exposure is working. And you don't want to control for things on the pathway, because then you block part of the effect of that thing. So you're stuck with this variable, this health status variable, that you want to control for and you don't want to control for. And, and traditional models, Cox models and logistic regression models, can't both control and not control for a variable. Um, but there's a new, this has been the, there's a, there's a new bunch of methods called G methods altogether. And these are G estimation, G computation, IPTW, and TMLE, which is taught here in the department. And these methods um, are really different from each other, but one thing they have in common is that they are really designed to handle this problem, this time variant confounding affected by prior exposure, exactly what that health status variable is. And, and it uh, handles it by, by breaking it apart. And these are really grounded in the counterfactual framework. Really? Uh-oh. Um, I'm going to skip the counterfactual framework. <laughs> Um, so for the <laughs> so th these um, but the methods usually, especially in a longitudinal study, you have to make exposure binary, and making exposure binary is a really hard pill to swallow in occupational epidemiology because people have put a lot of effort into characterizing exposure, a lot of it, and so your you know fancy statistician comes in, they're like, I need a cut point, I only want two, <gasps> that's terrible. But one brighter spin on that is the other thing these models can do really well is study interventions, hypothetical interventions. And an intervention is like if there were a new occupational exposure limit. So let's just say PM could not be above level X. Would we have seen more or less disease? That's binary, right? That's what your limit does. It puts in not above this level. And so you can use these models to predict what if everybody had been exposed under this level or versus if they had had the exposure they had actually received, would we have seen less diseases? So it's a little bit of a justification for the binary pain. Um, 
When you do an epidemiology study, you have to think about the target trial. I'm not going to have time to go into the target trial, but I'm going to do it anyway. Um, <laughs> I need to do an epidemiology study. There's an idea of thinking about the target trial. This is a, something that Gail Hernan has published on. And the idea is that you want to think about um, what would you do if you could do a clinical study? You can't do a clinical study of your observational data, but if you could do a clinical study, what would it look like? And then the difference between what it looks like and what you have can help illuminate where you have some biases. So if you could, your target trial for occupational epidemiology probably starts when the factory doors open. You have everyone who was first hired, you have all of their exposure, you have all of your outcomes. That's your ideal occupational study, right? So your timeline on follow-up is you have it all. From the moment anyone was ever exposed, you follow them forward, you get all of their exposure, all of their covariates, and all of their outcomes. But that's not really what happens in these big occupational studies. What really happens is a researcher gets access to some data from a company, which is amazing, but they get it on all the workers who are currently employed right then, like in 1980, for example. And they get their job records going back so they can fill it in and they can follow them forward for disease, but they only have it on the people who are employed as of 1980 or onwards. And so this is then, you don't, they don't have anyone who already left work because of exposure prior to that. So we just, what you're left with is a, um, a group of workers who already didn't die or already didn't leave from the exposure you're interested in studying. So you're, you have a bunch of survivors that you're studying in your cohort, and that, um, that's a little bit problematic. Oh, that's called a left truncated cohort because your person time is truncated on the left side of follow-up. So we have two, two ways that the healthy worker survivor group bias can play out. We have two different kinds of solutions. Um, the, the we have healthy worker survivor bias can happen before the start of follow-up and it can happen during the start of follow-up. And so if it happened before the start of follow-up, the only solution we really have right now is to restrict your analysis if you can to the people who are hired after the start of follow-up. If you have the power to do that, that's the solution we know of. But if you have data on their health status and all of their other time points and, and your healthy worker survivor mechanism is happening during follow-up, that's when you can use a G method. So I'm gonna show a couple applications. One is how we've dealt with left truncation. One is, uh, and two, how we've dealt with survivor bias that's happening during follow-up. So these are the fabricators the aluminum fabricators. And uh, we have here the numbers in the full cohort. This is everybody in the cohort. It's 8,000 workers and 500 deaths, and they all get IHD pretty young. And we can see that if we say, okay, well, how many of them were hired within 25 years of the start of follow-up? Most of them. But that's a long time. A lot can happen in 25 years. If I'm hired and my friend is hired within 25 years, one of us might get sick from the exposure and leave, right? So here we have within 10 years, we've got a smaller cohort. And here, these are all the people who hired after the start of follow-up, and it's a lot less people. But still enough to do an analysis. So here is an um, analysis of all these different sort of onion cohorts. We have a hazard ratio for IHD here, and we have exposure, cumulative exposure to PM2.5 here. And these red marks are like a flattened histogram of all of the um, workers and where all the cases and where their exposure went. And you can see that the exposure response is pretty strong for the people who were hired um, after the start of follow-up, but it attenuates really fast once you start including um, more and more proportions of survivors. And this makes sense. If you, if you have not already died from the exposure, if you have not already gotten sick from the exposure, you're super and you're great and you might not get sick from it. And we can see that this is true even down here where most of the exposure is occurring. All right, this was sort of a proof of concept that these models really work. And this is in the General Motors uh, aluminum fabricators cohort. So here we have hazard ratios up the y-axis. And we studied, I'm gonna concentrate on ischemic heart disease because that's what we're all here for. So Jonathan Chevrier, who wrote this when he was a postdoc here um, with Ellen, he, he read, did regular Cox models on um, the aluminum, or the auto workers. And he tried to adjust for healthy worker the way people have tried for years. They put in duration of employment in the model, they put in lots of stuff trying to adjust for it. And these are the results. They're all pretty null protective looking. And then he applied one of these G methods, G estimation, um, which can break out the, the time and the, and the health status. And you see that you then get a positive association. And similar work was then done by Andreas Niafitu, a postdoc here now also with Ellen, looking at the aluminum smelters and fabricators. 
Um, and so the black squares are traditional Cox models, and the um, little, are they golden? Little golden triangles are the IPTWG method. And for the fabricators, it actually doesn't matter which one you use. You still see an effect. And you see an effect also in smelters that gets stronger when you apply one of these methods. And what we discovered really with the fabricators and the smelters is that um, prior exposure in the fabs didn't really seem to make people that sick. Although once they got sick, they certainly reduced their exposure and got incident heart disease. But in the smelters, there was a pretty strong correlation between the prior exposure um, leading to poorer health in the smelter workers who then reduced their exposure, who then left work, who then got IHD. So this was an example of where we really had to use one of these methods. I'm on my last slide, thank you, she's okay. Um, so in conclusions, we've had a lot of progress in occupational uh, PM and cardiovascular disease in the last decade. It's not really easy to detect heart disease in an in a occupational cohort. When there's healthy worker survivor effect, the analyses are harder. You can do them, but they are harder. Um, and it may explain why there have been less studies published. I think if you don't really know how to unpack this bias and no one really wants to publish your null or protective looking study, it's not going to show up in the literature. Um, but I think that these methods will continue to, to be developed and continue to be used. And that's it. <clears throat> Questions for Sadie? Oh. I explained, oh, no. <laughs> I have one, but Julia does too. Oh. So I was just wondering about the sort of policy implications of then discovering this effect that was hidden before. You mean for realizing that, that the MI yeah. caused heart disease? Yeah. Well, hopefully what it will mean is that there'll be more considerations for what the occupational limits should be set on. Right now they're really set for cancer, um, mostly. So, and, and cancer, of course, is a problem but a lot more workers are getting cardiovascular disease. So the burden of disease could be a lot higher than originally thought. So that's my hope. Um, one of my comments on your <coughs> firefighters, they vary a little bit from the other cohorts yeah. because of the amount of energy that they have to expend in a very brief period of time. Yeah. And they've been in a measure way, beyond, way beyond levels that they should be able to Absolutely. I think they're a really unique group of workers in all of the um, PM cardiovascular disease groups. And contrary to popular thought, once they get hired, they don't generally maintain their place. <laughs> yes, I, I, mean, I just read something this morning about how they ended up like, really heavy. Yeah, a lot of them do. Yeah. And for those of you who don't know, that Dr. Drew Miller uh, has been heavily involved with studying firefighters yes. and their fitness and how much work they have to do for a lot of I'm just thinking with a couple of the talks and, and this with healthy workers, um, what kind of protective mechanisms might be, be occurring so that, you know, this provides sort of self immunity or whatever it is that ultimately makes it last long enough to be overexposed? I think we could figure that out. We could try to make the healthy worker effect happen more often in cohorts and protect the workers who are going to be susceptible. Um, I, you know, we, we don't have a lot of um, measured data in a lot of these studies. Um, we don't have a lot of covariate data. We certainly don't have genetics um, or other things that might help really figure out, you know, susceptibility. You know, I would make a comment here, just like we talked about after Mark Jarrett's uh, question to me, that risk factors for cardiovascular disease are multifactorial. Um, I think that's also true for the healthy worker survivor. Effect. So, just genetics, diet, habits, um, socioeconomic status, there's multiple. Mm -hmm. Stress. Mm -hmm.